Welcome to DevOps Accents, a podcast on everything around DevOps, public cloud, and cloud native topics with your hosts, Pablo, Leo, and Kirill. Hello, and welcome to another episode of DevOps Accent, a podcast where uh, we, the co founders of MKDev, get together and discuss all things around DevOps and cloud native technologies. Uh, this would be the episode 19. And before we begin, I have a small announcement. We are going to London for DevOps Days Conference on September 21st. And if you happen to be there, come say hi, because we are sponsoring the event and our booth will be there to meet you. And of course, we are going to have some swag for you and hold an exciting giveaway. You don't want to miss that. And as usual, the best way not to miss anything is to be subscribed to our bi-weekly newsletter, MKDev Dispatch, where we shall share all new things that happened at MKDev and around us, including new videos, webinars, articles, you name it, and announcements like this one. So go and subscribe right now. Uh, getting back to our podcast, Pablo is not with us this week and the next week too, because he's enjoying a well-deserved vacation, so you won't hear his hot Spanish accent today. But that doesn't mean that we have a limited cast, because today Kirill and I are joined by a very special guest, Paul Larson. Hi, Paul. So, uh... Paul is a data scientist with experience in nearly all things data and AI. He studied at Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship before completing his doctorate in mathematics at Humboldt University in Berlin. Very fancy. He has worked in financial services for over 10 years, first in banking, followed by insurance, and most recently at an early stage fintech startup. How about that? So, uh, Paul, what's your accent? What's my accent? Uh, my accent is messed up. That is what uh, I heard from last time I, you know, two times ago, I went back home to the States. They <laughs> said, uh, yeah, that my accent is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. this for you, another accents to the our circle of delicious accents. Uh, so guys, uh, Kirill, uh, guys, how do you know each other? How did you meet? And how did you end up here? Huh. Actually, Kirill, I'll take that if that's okay. So um, I was leading a, a team, a data science team. I built it up at part of Allianz for the global corporate and specialty insurance. So insuring ships, insuring uh, telecommunications companies, towers, manufacturing. And um, it was clear to us we were a data science team, a small team in this innovation. We'd had experience with DevOps, but we also knew that us just, hey, going and trying to figure out by reading blog posts, reading, reading the SRE book, um, that it would really help to insource some expertise about getting our, our data science development process working better. So we uh, then at that point, uh, Kirill was also working with an Allianz a kind of internal uh, consultancy. And so via them, we had Kirill with us for about four weeks, I think a four week engagement. And it was really fantastic. So it's one of these things that I think you find people that uh, can solve problems, can solve problems well, mm -hmm. which means you can figure out how to do things better, giving uh, a different tool set. And then the third category is people that dissolve problems. And Kirill certainly, I think, fit in this category. We wanted to do some crazy stuff. I remember this one conversation about branching strategies. And Kirill very patiently just kept on saying, why you don't need that? Why you don't need that? And after a while, I was like, yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> so we, we basically then moved on. He set up some Jenkins uh, pipelines, dashboards, et cetera, for our team. And we basically used that for the, the rest of our work together. Cool. And this is how you make the guest to introduce the host. Mm. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, basically, this means uh, you were in data science even before, like you've been there since since how long? And uh, because did you 
end up there from DevOps or you were there since since the beginning? No. Uh, so, okay. I background is in physics and mathematics. And then when I, I worked as a postdoctoral researcher um, after finishing and started working with the machine learning group at uh, Technical University Berlin, published one paper with, with the group there. So that was part of my moving into applied things and, and the data space. Uh, then with Deutsche Bank in Berlin, I was a risk model, a quantitative risk modeling. And I had done some computational work, but very kind of academic, you know, doing Monte Carlo simulations, a lot of for loops, things that don't necessarily, uh, at least you don't think you need advanced software, uh, development techniques, DevOps. And when I was, I remember in, with Deutsche Bank, I was using MATLAB and, and R, and I really liked with these languages that you can think like a mathematician, think like a, a statistician, and you don't have to worry about heap stack, all this low level stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of where I, where I started. Then I switched to data science and then into Python as, as the main language. And then I started getting a bit more into, uh, it's just interested me too, that you know, you, uh, you start doing something, you think, come on, there has to be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And so in, in deploying, doing some statistical analyses, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. So I started from colleagues, also from books. I mean, books from the, the 90s, classics, clean code, test-driven development, uh, reading these things. And so I think, I think you could say my journey over the last, uh, last several years is figuring out as somebody with a PhD in, in mathematics and expertise more in the mathematics and the data science, how much does it make sense to go down this in the direction of um, software development of DevOps and so forth? So what's the, you know, what's the return on investment? And I could be wrong, but I've recently come to the conclusion that um, unless I want to turn back the clock and, and do what Kirill and, and you or other people have done, that I probably, this is probably a good stopping point mm -hmm. <laughs> for me in terms of really developing in terms of cloud infrastructure and at this point, I think, I mean, there's so many exciting things, interesting things. You brought up LLMs and data science is happening, neural networks, deep learning, that um, I think for me personally, I'm at the stage now where if, if it's not something I've done before or somebody in my team, then I'd reach out to Kirill. I'd reach out to somebody else to rather than learning some, getting even deeper into DevOps, if that makes sense. Mm hmm yeah, that, that that's something that I wanted to uh, to tackle a little bit because you two were working uh, basically in the same area, like not not the same area, but you were cooperating uh, while working for Allianz. Uh, and uh, so uh, those who listen to us uh, all the time uh, basically know that I'm not the brightest person when it comes to technology. I am more like a marketing and a design and a design guy, but I understand the development quite well. I can get my head around the operations, but it took me quite some time to grasp the idea of DevOps, which is combines development and operations, right? And then there is uh, this term uh, ML ops, the things, this thing called like machine learning. Uh, to me, it's like a software, right? And then you have machine learning and operations. And it got me thinking, how different is it from the DevOps stuff we do uh, every day? I mean, there's got to be some overlap, right, Paul? And uh, you've been in this uh, data and AI world. So what's the deal with uh, ML ops and how does it like uh, on, on you, from your perspective, how does it mesh with our good old <laughs> DevOps? Sure. Um, maybe I'll step back and kind of set the scene with what is data science or how to think about data science and machine learning. Absolutely. Okay. So I think data science, what helps me is to think there are kind of two different types of data science. There's type A, which stands for kind of analyze. And this is, uh, I think it was 20, um, uh, around 2010 or so, Harvard Business 
review said that data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. And this is the typical thing that you hear when you say, hey, data science is super exciting. And you hear things like, oh, we take massive amounts of unstructured data and create these amazing business insights, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of type A. A is sort of for analyze. And here it's going to be, it's, you can think of it as kind of a supercharged business and business analyst, business intelligence. Mm -hmm. So instead of just a simple SQL queries to get dashboards, you're doing some much more complicated uh, statistical techniques to get some insights, which then you feed back to the business, probably in some, again, some dashboard that they either use or they ignore. Mm -hmm. uh, the second type of data science is you could say B, type B and B would be for build. And this is, I think this then fits a lot more into this, I think your, your question, Leo, about a kind of intersection with de DevOps. So this means you are building a, some service that instead of doing this service uh, deterministically for standard software, you're you're taking some uh, data, some historical data, and you're using, you have to make some decision. Decision could be um, giving a credit score. So give a loan, yes or no. It could be something like uh, standard computer vision. Is this a a bicycle in front of me, or is this a trash can, right, for, for autonomous driving? So it's taking typically uh, more complicated and more data than a person could just look at or write a simple rule for as the input. And then the other main difference for decisions or predictions made from sort of data science, this B approach uh, compared to heuristics or, or standard software development is then the outcome is also this decision function is more complicated than something you can just look at. You know, it's not just an if then else, right? It's not it's not rules based. I mean, it can be rules based, but they're not rules that you can articulate. And the reason is because you're the the data coming in is too big, too varied, too complicated. But also the possible outcomes and and how they relate, it's more than you could just list on a screen or on some Excel and say, hey, this is this is why it shows bicycle over uh, trash can for autonomous driving. This is why it shows grant the loan versus uh, reject the loan or, or give it. This is why it, it came up with this price for your car insurance policy, for example. Okay. So, um, right. So this is the basic, you know, why, why would you use data science to build a component? And then the final thing is kind of data science versus machine learning. And here the it's, it's all fuzzy, right? There's no clear distinction. People use these terms. They use AI for everything. Mm -hmm. But the, the distinction I like best is from uh, Andras Tori, who is uh, the head of um, Samantha, which is real-time bidding for online news content. It's a Slovenian. It's probably the, the, the biggest, the best Slovenian uh, ML company. Um, and he distinguishes machine learning is when you have a problem, like what we were just discussing, complex, not super easy or super high volume data going in. And the outputs, you know, you don't expect to have a simple rule based procedure to understand how you go from input to output. So machine learning is where this is so standard, you can abstract away the business logic. You know, computer vision is a good example. If you if you want to recognize um, object detection, you know, is this a mug? Is this a, this, you know, the mug isn't here. This doesn't really matter whether it's object detection for some claims process and insurance or whether it's object detection for autonomous driving. So it's, it's basically physics based. It's, you, it's, it's a well enough defined domain that you can abstract away the, you know, what's the business problem. It doesn't matter. And really focus on the technical technical side of things, just optimizing. And, and these machine learning problems in this sense are are also better suited for kind of DevOps for this really full mature automation. And to continue with this example of Samantha, uh, so Dev, uh, quite mature uh, DevOps, mm -hmm. it sounds very impressive from talking to them. And they are doing regular model releases and they're doing auto ML. So they're automatically retraining their models based on the data that comes in. Okay. So that's machine learning. And then on this, so which is a subset of data science. And I think to think about them differently in, in data science as a building something, the business domain and the business project is much 
more important, is relatively more important. So you really need the, the input from these business experts. So, and the way I like to think about this is if there's anything that involves human decisions or human decisions doesn't just mean, hey, did you decide to buy this versus that? It could also be you have regulation. So financial services, they're highly regulated industries. Oh, yeah. You have to understand why, why the model has to be, behave in a certain way or your predictions have to behave or it's just a complicated process, then I consider that more of a traditional data science problem in this build. And that also means in terms of kind of how it relates to DevOps, one implication, you're going to want to have more human involvement. You're not going to want to automate your release process as aggressively as you could with a more, say, machine learning, uh, pure machine learning problem. It's interesting about the, the learning part, right? Because correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't been involved in uh, machine learning projects in the last couple of years, but there's always like two phases in machine learning and ML ops is that there is this learning phase where you kind of do some batch jobs to train the model. And then there is deployment phase. And that's different from yes. traditional DevOps process where you have like, you, you build a new container image with a new application version and you more or less instantly roll it out to production. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think, so, so now and, and why do you need this? Why do you need this learning phase? And, and now we're getting to, so I think what are the core differences or things that distinguish people trying to do ML ops from, from DevOps? And it's this, it's this data dependency, uh, and, and this, this training phase. So the, I think one of the good starting places is a NeurIPS paper from Google people from 2015, I think called hidden technical debt in machine learning systems. And they highlight, and everybody that's worked on this knows this, that um, it's not it's not going to be a couple of test cases or even you know dozens of test cases for your for your web service that you have to make sure this goes right. But you're you're training these models, you're getting something ready and deciding which to use uh, on at least thousands and often millions or billions of of data records. So you have this training phase and this model selection phase. Hey of all the different types of, of machine learning models you can use, of all the ways you can parametrize this, which one is the best for your business process? This is this training and, and model selection phase, which you have this to a small degree and you have customer acceptance testing, right? Mm. So you you show somebody, but but this customer acceptance testing is is a huge part because getting to this these models that that should help your business problem is is much more complicated than involved. And it, it, to me, this sounds. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Kirill. I, I I wanted to comment because uh, it, it sounds a little bit like magic. Because when I think about, um, like we do this every day from our consumer uh, point of view, like updating our applications. Like for example, we have I have this chat application on my phone, and uh, every uh, now and then it's an update pop-ups, but when you think how it works on the backend and from the operation point of view, like m all my charts, all my files are still stay the, uh, where they were before the update, and you have to keep all this data so that users don't lose, um, uh, don't lose them, don't lose contact, and then and and when I try to think how what you need to think about before running this update, that's that's a lot. But then when I try to imagine what you need to do and what you need to consider when you uh, applying an update for uh, for another model in uh, mm -hmm. machine learning, like it's not like that. Uh, this machine forgets what it. Uh, new before the update, and it's suddenly overnight new new stuff. Now new stuff. It's it works like an entirely different way. Uh, I and and when I try like to imagine, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. If you're doing your job well, it's not working in an entirely different way. No. 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 So so are, are you telling me this works basically the same? Do you just need to rewrite a bigger chunk of data? Okay, so the simplest way of a model update is you change nothing, you just get more recent data. Yeah, and then you just run it through again, or you, you do some time windowing, because you always want to, 
you're not using all the data to train the model. You have a holdout set. So you, but basically you just add more data. Um, you can do this, but I think that now we're getting to this customer acceptance of this. You have to be really sure that whatever changes or sure enough, whatever changes makes sense, right? That the business accepts it. And this is, this is different. I mean, it's different quantitatively, if not qualitatively from, uh, from standard DevOps. Nevertheless, okay, so what are some things that a lot of people don't do, but I think you should do that, that are between software engineering and uh, software development and, and machine learning? So in DevOps, so cross-functional team, yes, right? You especially need this business input. Code versioning, not everybody does. Most teams do in some form. Uh, testing, this is one of the things that typically data scientists leave until the very end, which means that they never do it, or they write like one integration test. So I, I mostly follow test-driven development. I, I, I love it. I like it personally. I tried to force two teams to do it and it didn't quite work, but it kind of worked that I led. So you should, but tests are different. So that maybe we'll stop here and get to your, your points, Leo. So I want to have unit tests um, in my data science code, machine learning code. So I don't have to remember why in the world did I write this that way? So one of the key functions of, of unit tests for me is having like with everybody, you have confidence in your code. You have these test cases that tell you exactly what your code is supposed to do for these test cases. But this is not like for the big training. This is all the peripheral stuff to get your training to work. Mm -hmm. So what makes machine learning different is, is this really this learning part where you have this complex data where Look, there's, you're not going to, you're not, if you had a series of test cases to make sure it was working exactly the way you want it, then you wouldn't need a machine learning model. Mm. Then you'd be back in this domain of simple if then else, you know, decision trees, right? Nevertheless, there are things you can and should do and for testing and to make sure that what you were just saying doesn't happen, that from one day to the next, uh, it's totally different unless it's totally different and completely better. And there are examples of this. Um, actually, Google Translate is, I think, the best example of this. Around 2014, I'm probably getting the, the I didn't look this up ahead of time. They went from a, a non-deep learning based approach in Google Translate overnight to um, a deep learning based approach. Yeah, yeah, I remember that a lot of people noticed the difference. And and they didn't tell anybody, right? But then you had these people picking up on how much better it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Back to testing and try to avoid this shock of everything's different. Is it why doesn't my application work? So the main, um, it's harder, but it's possible to test these machine learning models. Um, and it's probably more potentially, I don't know if it's more important, but equally important. So I think the main category of tests for this is what you could call a ratchet test. And the simplest way to think of this is if you have a certain performance metric that your business says is acceptable, in the previous version, let's say accuracy is 80%, or normally you do some more refined metrics, things called precision recall, whatever. If you say, okay, we need 90% accuracy, the business says, yeah, you know, if we have 90% accuracy, then our, our return on investment is, is good enough. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Then you don't release unless your new model gets at least 90% accuracy. So this is called a ratchet test because you, you're ratcheting up. Mm -hmm. You know, you never go down. You never let the weight that you're picking up go further down. You never let your key metric go down. Um, what I think you should also do, and, and I've been doing this and I, I like it. It's a bit harder though for, um, for data privacy reasons than in standard development is a ratchet test where you actually have basic sanity checks. Like, mm -hmm. so a problem in this FinTech that uh, one of the main problems we were working on is financial data companies is recognizing what are different variants of the same company. So Starbucks limited Heathrow versus Starbucks uh, Heathrow airport, et cetera, that would show up on different financial records. And also depending on your business problem, there's probably, and I've seen this both at this FinTech also working with Allianz, there are certain examples that your model should never get wrong. If your model gets this wrong, it's gonna be, you're gonna lose all confidence among your, your customers, right? Absolutely. Um, and also sanity things. So, so then you have a test suite. This is also like a ratchet, but not based on a metric, but based on certain cases. And the reason, and this is probably, maybe I'll stop after this, but another reason that makes MLOps harder than regular DevOps is that 
it's a lot of work and hard to get this sort of anonymized data, anonymized realistic data that that you need to actually test your model. So you either have to make sure you know that there are no natural persons in there, you have to anonymize, this is a lot of work. So you can't, and again, you can't enumerate all the things, um, but this, I think, Maybe to wrap up this section, I think this is important. Again, for you know that you know that you haven't regressed on these cases, right? So I think it's worth the effort. My experience is worth the effort. Um, and I think another reason, uh, yeah, okay, this is just a generic one. I think one of the generic uh, similarities between DevOps and MLOps is LGTM is not good enough, right? looks good to me, mm -hmm. somebody looks over the results, say, hey, yeah, sure. It doesn't mean you, you can automate everything. You don't have to. But I think really being uh, explicit with your customers, what are the acceptance criteria? How are we going to monitor this? And the more business logic you have in your problem, then the more feedback you're going to need from your business to make sure that you're respecting this business logic before you do a release. The cloud tech industry is evolving so fast. Do you keep up with it by improving your skills or upskilling your team? At MKDev, we offer a variety of workshops for just that, from the basics to expert knowledge. Before delivering our workshops and training sessions, we carry out a detailed assessment of each participant. To make sure the workshop is helpful for you and your team, we will add more content to it or throw out what you already know or we create a custom workshop specifically for the needs of your team and the specifics of your project. Uh, okay, Kirill, but uh, from from your perspective, like uh, as a infrastructure engineer, how does it look from your side? Uh, because you are not a data science person, right? And n now now we need to understand how it looks from uh, from pure DevOps perspective when they work with someone like you. and. For them, like Kirill, uh, you explain to me and to our listeners this part. Like, does it look from your side like uh, th is it is it like you're working with uh, regular software and there are some intricacies, but it is not your responsibility to fix them or to get your head around it. It's Paul's responsibility, and you just accept whatever he says to you and you just do your job as regular or it's entirely different process. What I see most often is that the data science or ML team, they need some specific hardware or specific infrastructure to run the learning and to train the models. And after you provide this infrastructure, kind of the collaboration stops. So there is quite often there is no dedicated DevOps infrastructure engineer inside the data team. Mm -hmm. And there is no day-to-day -day, um, collaboration between, let's say, platform or infrastructure team with them. It's more like we need big bare metal machines with the GPUs, and we need some something like OpenShift with the Kubeflow to be able to do our job. But once you install it, it's like, okay, here's your access, and then do what you want. And I think really that MLOps is something that is trying to, the, the idea is trying to solve this. Because, again, from my experience, it's a lot of silos in this area. Uh, which I can understand probably also because just the nature of work is slightly different. There is, in regular DevOps, there is no learning phase, right? There is like, the pipelines are simple. You push, build, test, and deploy the application. In case of uh, training models, it's just, you can probably map it roughly to similar pipeline stages, but it's just... I have to imagine the bigger the model, the longer it takes to test anything. Like the extreme example is the ChatGPT because it was like this trillion params and they train and show such a huge amount of data that I cannot even imagine how for months. Yeah, yeah. hard it is for them to roll out any simple change because they change the the model, the code, and then what does it do? Start, start like four or five months training period to get all the data in. Or they just hope it works because I hear lots of reports that now they were doing some changes to the model in case of OpenAI, and then GPT-4 became worse in last month. Yeah, yeah, this is one of these things. I mean, there, there are two components here. One is the, the initial training uh, and training of what in LLMs is called a foundational model. 
And the other are these corrections which are happening continuously. And these corrections that are happening continuously is part of a um, reinforcement learning human feedback process, RLHF. So it doesn't involve training everything from scratch, um, but but you're still getting these with chat GPT with, if you don't pick an endpoint uh, from GPT that has a, a fixed release, every day you're getting something different. For the more generic the model is, the bigger the problem is, right? So if you have some model to recognize particular uh, objects from the images, is different than you're building the model that tries to recognize everything from the image. Uh, then something like GPT, which tries to be yeah, yeah. like the model for absolutely everything. Like it's, it's, a, it's a meta learning, exactly. It, it can do multiple tasks surprisingly well, yes. Yeah. But then the whole like adjustment and correction phase is just very fragile probably for them to yeah. handle. Okay. But, but it's also not clear. I mean, I think this is where it really... So these LLMs have huge potential and it's really, for me, this was a, a mindset shift when I started using uh, chat GPT and using these endpoints because it can do things. It's just, it's just, it's not different uh, qualitatively from what you could do with these other, other uh, language models, but it's just a lot better at a lot of different tasks. So, but one of the things that uh, now, now, now you think about, okay, you want to have continuous integration, right? You want to have some tests. We were just talking about this for a large language model. This is over how many tasks. And I'm sure OpenAI and, and Google, they have uh, pretty phenomenal test suites. They're also, I mean, super hot topic, important topic is getting uh, misleading inflammatory content out of these. They have to really monitor that. But I think one of the challenges, one of the reasons that this this huge excitement about LLMs will, and it is already degrading over time, is that people realize just getting something to work that works well today, LGTM, that this is not good enough, mm -hmm. right? So if you think that you can cheat the process, uh, avoid having any sort of tests, any sort of kind of pipelines, just throw everything on an LLM, you can probably convince your stakeholders for the demo in, in two weeks, whatever, they'll be super excited. They'll say LGTM, awesome. But then getting this to work over time, if you're not doing your homework, is going to uh, backfire, is my my sense. Uh, getting back a little bit, uh, I have these questions about uh, learning process. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, when you are training uh, the model, especially the large language model, and you said that it took a uh, month uh, for OpenAI to train uh, whatever they're training. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, imagine how this process works and how sensitive it the, the process to interruptions because I imagine like this is something similar to when you are starting washing machine to work and and you can can stop the process uh halfway through because you have to uh drain your wash machine then start and you uh, add a uh, laundry detergent again and start again it is the same like uh, how reliable should be your hardware and software that runs uh uh, the training process because if something breaks, will it broke the, and the, the the process or you can uh, fix it on the go and continue the process. But if you do this, will the result be like a little bit retarded <laughs> because of that? Uh, I, I okay, that's probably was stupid. Trying to think of this. So, so parallelization, the parallelization of this training has been documented in the academic papers about these models. Um, and the hardware parallelization, how they manage that robustness to failure modes. I have little doubt that they're pretty good <laughs> in how they do this. Okay. It's not going to be, I heard this case, I won't name names, but, uh, uh, okay. This is also sometimes, I mean, we were quite lucky at Allianz really, uh, not just with Kirill's help, but quite good technology, uh, provision for us to use. But it's not going to be like the guy I talked to some other insurance company who started a calculation on his laptop and had to leave it in his car overnight with the with the lid open to make sure it didn't stop overnight or, or what i was doing during my phd in research oh you start something and you hope it doesn't you hope it doesn't stop otherwise 
um, I can't tell you exactly how they manage this, but I have no no doubt that they they have this well under control. So, but it's true, right? So if if it something goes south, uh, you have to start in you, and that that the reason. It's, but it's it's like with any okay. So technically speaking, what happens is you you have these parameters that you're training. So it's going to be your weights and biases. If this means anything, it's going to be just a bunch of numbers, mm -hmm. and um, the. Not not just with GPT, but for for years, this well, with GP, GP using GPUs, what really made this go better is parallelization. Is it using stochastic gradient descent as the name? But you can parallelize these things, and that's particularly for um, speed reasons. So you can be having, you know, you can put it on GPU back then. You put it on multiple CPUs, have them running in parallel, which means that they've already from the beginning of this deep learning have dealt with this problem of combining results coming from different sources and this robustness uh, issues that you're bringing up. So this is nothing new for machine learning, this problem, um, but you're absolutely right. The scale of it is just much bigger with running something over, I, don't, I won't say the number, I think I read somewhere how many, no, it's kind of proprietary, but somebody told me how many GPUs, uh, NVIDIA GPUs they were using over, I think it's the number of three, four months. How much did the cloud in general improve the work? Because so for the infrastructure engineering, just moving from the bare metal on-premise work to something like AWS was like a huge jump because there are so many things you don't have to do anymore. Yeah. And this whole elasticity and flexibility you get over your infrastructure is just completely different game that you play in the cloud compared to on-premise. Yeah, yeah. Was it the same moment for the data science and machine learning? Yeah, if you have compute issues, absolutely. Like big compute issues, right? This is a game changer. If you can still do it on a simple machine, then it makes things worse. <laughs> so if you can, I remember we had this initial setup where we had virtual machines and they weren't huge, but hey, a lot of problems aren't big data, they're medium data. And if you have to move this to some containerized, uh, so productivity went down at some point when we went from virtual machines, uh, okay, somewhat virtualized, but, but not running in, 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 uh, not totally containerized to a, a pure cloud solution for just for the development person. So this is the training phase, the initial. So one of the things that, um, I try to do as long as you don't have, uh, personally identifiable data. So, if you don't have natural, if you have natural persons, then you really need to make sure that your data stays on some, you know, certified, hardened uh, data repository. But if you're in the lucky situation where you can anonymize the data, one of the things I've always tried for with my teams is to have dev prod parity, which also means the that if you can do it locally on your laptop, uh, you should always start there because you have network issues once you're connecting to say blob storage, once you're connecting to, to remote compute, you have network issues, you have latency, you have more. Yeah. So, so I think, I think for the really, for, for a lot of things, okay. The one thing off the top of my head, um, and, and the work that you did, uh, with, with my team, my previous team, Kirill, uh, having this cloud and CI infrastructure, it made the pull request process a lot faster. Because one of the typical, what are the two typical problems that data science teams do? You develop something locally, and it could be locally on a laptop or locally on a virtual machine. You say LGTM, mm -hmm. you know, even if you have a test suite, it works well on my machine. And then you give it to somebody else, they start writing the code, huh, this doesn't work. And, and you're in this typical, oh, that's funny, it worked for me. But it's even more difficult because it's not just the, the code and some sample data for a web interface, but it's, it's also this big data dependency, you know, uh, tables with, with hundreds of thousands of rows, things like this. So what, um, we did with, uh, with the CICD is that you have your test suite. You have that maybe you, what I've done is I don't for model training. I don't, of course, do a full model retrain as part of continuous integration, but you just take, you know, a very small model retrain, right? So you only do it for a hundred records or a thousand records. So you're not going to get any results, but at least no, you know you didn't break something. So if somebody else is trying to review the code or then you're moving it, it it reduces the, um, it, yeah, it basically reduces these simple mistakes just because you forgot to commit something or you forgot to make something available. There's some dependency in your local environment that you forgot to add to your 
but your um, environment configuration file, things like that. <laughs> the way, uh, well, the way how you describe your experience uh, at Alliance uh, resembles uh, to me. This sounds like a, a group of enthusiasts in the basement <laughs> working on something excited and exciting, and they are trying to uh, utilize whatever means that have at their disposal. Um, but you have. Despite despite the the scale of the company of the enterprise, it still sounds like uh, like a group of nerds doing something very exciting. Uh, and you've been working in a smaller uh, fintech startup. Uh, how would you compare? Like, has it changed? Uh, from a uh, large enterprise to a smaller company, or it's still the same, uh, a group of enthusiasts are trying to pull out something spectacular? Yeah, so I think there are probably more similarities than differences. And I think this is maybe not typical of kind of enterprise experience, but I had the good fortune of, so when I moved from risk modeling into data science, every team that I've been in at Allianz uh, then considered itself a startup within a big company, right? So it was, I mean, basement is, is exaggerated. We had quite good, actually the, the managers did their best and for, for enterprise IT, we had quite good infrastructure. So it was really, I mean, everybody complains, but, but objectively speaking, it was, it was quite good. <laughs> um, so how does it compare? So I think, I think some of the things that are absolutely the same um, and, and what you said too about, Hey, people trying to do stuff exciting. This is a blessing and a curse, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, when you're in innovation teams, whether it's a startup or with an enterprise, uh, there's this curse of, Oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we could do this? Well, yeah, it might be interesting. It might be some cool tech that you can apply or new algorithms, but unless the business is going to back, not just, you know, getting some demo, some prototype POC, but you can really establish the business value and that over time, uh, it's not going to continue, right? So tackling the right business problem. And I think one thing that I saw, um, there's the temptation, this is universal, whether it's a startup or, a, or, or enterprise, there's a temptation to go too quickly into the solution phase and not spend enough time in really understanding the problem, really challenging the customer. Is this really what we need? Do we really need this feature? Do you really need it to predict that? So that's, that's just human nature, I think. Okay. Uh, a second thing that's similar is the importance of focus. And this again relates to the business problem. You really have to be uh, laser focused. And I've seen, I've seen the downside of trying to do too much to too many people, but this is not just, this is also for standard software. I think it's maybe a bit, a bit, more important in the data science space because there's so much in machine learning there's so much volatility there's so many unknowns and, and complicated things with the with this you know massive amounts of input data coming in and then interpreting the results coming out that's perhaps even more important to be really laser focused um the biggest difference is the tooling available to you right if you're with a startup the worst thing you can do is not use the money that the VC or investors have put forward, right? They want you to spend money on the tooling that you need uh, to get the job done better. Whereas with enterprise, um, it's, uh, there are more constraints, you know, there probably there's more often for regulatory reasons, but this also cuts both ways. I mean, um, it's super exciting to be able to try every new thing that comes out, but then there's always a cost. There's, you know, does it make sense for you to, uh, I think the best example is say prefect versus airflow for organ or for orchestration of data pipelines. You know, the, the cool kid is prefect. Mm -hmm. uh, airflow was the cool kid four years ago or wherever when Airbnb uh, open sourced it. Um, there, there are pros and cons, right? And you have to be very deliberate about just because you have access to whatever tooling you have the money for, um, really it pays to be deliberate about choosing it. And I think in machine learning, when there's so much volatility in the data you're working with and the, and the outcomes, it actually pays to be more conservative in your tooling choice. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Uh, all right, uh, Paul, I have my the 
last question to you, uh, probably like a more a joke. <laughs> so, so Paul, uh, do Android dream of electric sheep? <laughs> Android? I, sorry, I didn't. Can you repeat the thing? Androids. Do Androids dream of electric sheep? <laughs> ah, this is this is the um, Philip uh, Dickens, right? Yes, Philip, Philip K. Dick. Yeah. So. I, I'm really interested in this. So I, I had the, this was part of the, the Rhodes funding. This was before the financial crisis. I had a, a third year of funding. I did mathematics and then I did a one year history, history of science and technology. And, and this stuff really interests me. And, and when I started in data science, one of the best things I did is I, I said, okay, if I'm working on artificial intelligence, I should try to understand human intelligence more. So I read mm -hmm. Daniel Kahneman. He's a Nobel prize winner in economics, his book, thinking fast and slow about all the funny ways the brain works. And to put it simply, the brain works very differently from how computers worked, at least no. uh, up until recent recent uh, developments. Mm -hmm. The How good these large language models are at doing a large number of tasks has challenged one of the opin strong opinions I've had up until then, which is that you can't have real, uh, like human level artificial intelligence unless there's a body so that the, the mind is very, the body really matters. Um, and, and you can, I mean, if you, sorry, I'm getting a bit philosophical here. And also, <laughs> so I, one of my favorite authors is also Oliver Sacks, who is a neurologist and he's known for the movie, well, the book first and then movie awakenings about these, these people with Parkinson's disease that were catatonic. And then they just came to life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I read that. And, um, you know, what a baby does to actually learn, you're, you're making these connections. It's, we, we don't know how to see, we actually learn how to see. There's some stuff hardwired, but it's, it's a learning process that involves the, the, the body. So as a baby, if you see baby, okay, I have a, I have a she's 14 now, today's the first day of school, mm -hmm. but as babies, they'll, they'll hit themselves and wake themselves up at night because they don't know that this is their hand, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So human level intelligence, what um, large language models, especially GPT has done, has challenged this opinion that without bodies, uh, you can't have human level intelligence. Though I think maybe one way to, uh, so it surprised me. I'm not saying, I'm not one of these people that's saying, hey, this is going to happen. I was actually more one of these skeptics saying, hey, they're not even going to get close. You know, things have reached a limit. Um, so I think one way you can understand that is just the way that they've trained this on on this text basis, on Wikipedia, on books, on scholarly articles, on code base, it's kind of it's kind of like a proxy. They're taking everybody's human experience in the human body with the human brain, and learning how to put these together to solve a surprising number of tasks surprisingly well. Uh, what I still feel firmly about, so do androids dream of electric sheep, <laughs> is that the question of, you know, is this general artificial intelligence or not? This is hugely important from a societal perspective, from a business perspective, technology's perspective, as long as your, you know, your ethics is in line, you're not doing crazy stuff. As long as you're matching these ethics, whether it's general artificial intelligence or not, it just doesn't matter. It's still a problem of, hey, you have a business problem. Mm -hmm. um, is this tool going to be better? Is it better to, to take a large language model and use this or to take some specialized model or not? I think... The focus, it's, it's a bit of a distraction uh, unless you're really engaging on this political level and, and societal level, which, which again is very important. But from a business level, I think it doesn't really matter whether Androids dream, dream about electric sheep or not. Yeah, because in the end, we are here to <laughs> build a business <laughs> after all, right? Yeah. Okay, Paul. Thank you so much for joining in today. It was like oh, thank uh, you. That's that, that 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 was crazy, and I would love to, this conversation to go on and go on. But unfortunately, we have a limited time, and we have to fit in the podcast format after all. <laughs> and for those who have been listening to us, uh, send us your questions and your impressions uh, by replying to our. MKDF Dispatch Newsletter, you know the drill. Just hit the reply button. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every week we have news, updates, and uh, great videos for you to watch and to understand. And for to you, Kirill, Paul, 
thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing all the information and all the cool stories. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks, Kirill. Thanks, Leo. Thank you. Hey, bye, guys. Bye bye. Do you think your project infrastructure is well set and maintained? We know for sure there is always room for improvement. If you are uncertain where to begin, let's first do an audit of what you already have. We will review your setup from every angle, performance, cost, security, high availability, and automation, and provide you with a detailed roadmap of which direction your infrastructure should go, generate concrete tasks for you to implement, or even take on your infra entirely, if you let us, of course.